have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hi, guys. I'm Mike Mixtape. Welcome to Cinema Royale. Let me introduce to you to my fellow film aficionados and a special guest of ours, but I'll get to that later. First up is our man from Montreal, Matt Brune, also known as Animat. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? I don't know what else to say. Hello. Wait, I need to put the volume a little higher for you guys, so... Okay, now I can hear things. Oh, um, that's good, that's good. Just, the just preparing. The man next to Matt, eating his supper, is James Sullivan, also known as Hamitude. Two nights broadcast is brought to you by Adventures in Windows 10 installations and Ewan McGregor getting a public hand job. Getting a what? <laughs> by oh, who? Wow. It, it was a movie that I saw last night called Night Watch. Oh, there goes Jada. And there goes Jada. Great. I started the podcast. Now I'm getting technical difficulties. Shit. Maybe she Jada has turned into a dog. Oh, no. <laughs> or maybe Jada has a secret crush on you and McGregor and you angered her furiously. Eating his what? His <laughs> what? Eating his what? <laughs> Eating his what? <laughs> Eating his Are we still what? talking no. about... McGregor? Yes, <laughs> getting, I think so. Getting a public hand job, not eating anything. Oh my. Oh, I he said, didn't go that far? <laughs> I said James eating his supper. Dinner. Okay, hold on a minute. Was I the only one that got that problem just now? Yes. Yes, yes you're the only one. It's Skype. It said there was this... a problem with the call. That means the entire call. It wasn't affected on my end. Me neither. It's Skype. It's just Skype. It's just Skype, Jada. We've been doing this for God knows how long, and this is always. We're used to it. Anything. I. It's Skype. It's just break her, and basically she's gone. It broke her along with her Skype. (laughs) Whatever now. If if the webcam works, let's see. It's turned it on. Let's see. It's, it's, let's see. it's loading on my Walk end. Dub 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 dub. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. All right. Hey, good. Mike, uh, Matt, uh, Matt, you did. He did it. Huzzah. All right. All right. Good. I did and... it. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the magic. He's got the magic. Uh, yes, the the girl who has technical difficulties. Not always, but sometimes. Jada, Jada. Hi, kids. We are not being held here against our will. It's <laughs> <laughs> a legitimate business practice, and we hope you all enjoy. Uh, joyous. And our guest tonight is a man known as Charles Thomas, also known as Duke C.T., Hello. What is this and uh, sin- oh, since uh, <laughs> since some of you guys might know Duke CT for uh, for his uh, wrestling podcast and whatnot, and uh, my um, other show, including Last Review or Standing, that was featured on Manic Expression on its uh, best video of the week. Yay! Well, Congratulations. Yeah, I just yes. want to say, rest in peace, Roddy. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, I did want to bring that up too, as like in memory, because goddamn Rodney, God Piper, why did you have to die on me? <laughs> they live well, is like the best movie ever, man. Yes, and honestly, probably one of the best eighty, probably one of the up there of eighties movies. Yes, movie like that couldn't be made today. Nope. Uh, if they do, I'm gonna kill them. It'd be just like what RoboCop was, but we'll get to that. We'll we'll get, get into that. that. Yes, and today's topic is about remakes. Yes. Remakes. I think they did remake it, only it was uh, called something really, really stupid. Was it called Branded? Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw that title. I didn't watch it, but I saw that. I was like, what? It's okay, Mike. Nobody watched it. No. I Thank God nobody watched it. Yeah. It's... Yeah. Uh. But yeah, remakes... Remakes are an interesting breed of films. Like, 
guess Hollywood's out of ideas, and they're like, you know what, we'll remake these films for a new audience and give them some fresh new perspectives and all that stuff. Mm. And, uh, and most remakes are not shot by shot remakes, like, per shot. These remakes are usually, like, reimagining or contemporary or updated remakes. And we'll discuss all these, and, uh, I figure I should start... Uh, for once in the podcast. I don't think I've ever started in a podcast, so it's just a different change of pace. And uh, Why don't you ever give yourself that honor? I don't know. Get some love, man. Give yourself some love. Because we I need can... to save him, Matt, because now that he's going first, they're all going to turn it off as soon as he's done. <laughs> Whoa! hey oh. Not my idea. <laughs> no, it's Jada's. Okay, yeah, so I figure I start off with a good remake that I've decided to talk about. Um, uh, I chose Scarface, which people are like, wait, Scarface is a fucking remake? Um, yes. Yes, yes, Scarface mm-hmm. is a remake. Scarface is a remake of a 1932, this 1932 film, the same name, and I uh, kind of watched the, re- the original just to see the comparisons between remake and stuff and vice versa and uh, the 1932 film is a gangster film uh, set in the probation era I believe in Chicago and it's about an Italian immigrant coming to Chicago and he climbs his way up the uh, mob ladder to the top to get everything he needs and the so it's like the rise and fall of it was the story is based on like the rise and fall of Al Capone, so it was just like, you know, rise and fall of how somebody from regs to riches, pretty much. Bro, Al Scarface Capone? No wonder. <laughs> no wonder. Of course, the and... story of Scarface Al Capone doesn't end with a massive shootout and everybody dead, so. And that's the thing about this is, uh, I watched the remake first and then the original because I didn't know it was a remake at first. I just thought it was the original film. And I just I just let it go like that. But I watched the original, and I just noticed some little things. It's like, oh, that, that, oh, he's, he's got a scar. He's a, okay, that's good. He's got a sister. Okay, that's good. Oh, it, it's a lot of 30s talk, you she. A lot of she's, okay. <laughs> you, you dirty Mercy rat, you. Man. You dirty rat, I'm going to kill you. Oh, I worse mean, than what the frog, see? It's... It's not a bad film. It's actually 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, so it's certified fresh. So it's 100%? really. Damn. Yeah. It's... Well, I mean, it is considered a classic nowadays. It's a classic. So. It's a classic. So, um, but there, uh, as I was watching the original, I kind of noticed that there's some subtle things like, <laughs> I mean, it's the 30s. It's gangster stuff, movie uh, mob stuff, and there's a couple of shootouts where. <laughs> They, they have it at a bowling alley, and one of the moments I remember is that, I guess, Tony, uh, his, his name's not Tony Montana in this, it's, a, it's an Italian last name, which I cannot pronounce, but it's they changed it for the remake, just for convenience sake. Um, so, like, it's, the remake's not, like, a total remake of the original, it's just the little differences here and there, but in the original, they're, they're shooting at, at a bowling alley, and the guy's, like, bowling, he's like, check this out, and he rolls the ball. And he gets shot, but the ball keeps rolling and it gets a strike. Oh. <laughs> I was like, he, oh, he struck out. I get it. Oh. He struck out. Shut up. That was just so funny. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not so bad. I mean, if you like 30s movies and you like gangster films, you could probably have to check it out if you want to. The remake, however, oh, the remake, however... The remake, however, oh my god, 1983. Um, the thing I love about the 80s, yeah. the thing I love about the 80s is that they, there are some remakes they do of like classic films, like from the 30s and 40s. Uh, on the Mel Brooks episode, I talked about uh, To Be or Not To Be, which is a remake of a 40s film, which I thought was pretty good. So, uh, Scarface stars Al Pacino. Oh, Al Pacino, man. Over the top acting, man. Cube. So in this, in the remake, it's a little bit different. It's a Cuban immigrant coming to Miami. So it's a little bit. Di- it's kind of contemporary take on the story of a rise and fall 
uh, yeah, rise and fall of uh, a drug kingpin. And uh, I was actually just rechecking the remake just before this podcast, just to see the comparisons between, between the original and I. I noticed things that I never discovered before. It's like, oh, they both have sisters. Okay, the character has sisters, and um, the rise and fall. It's a bit different. Um, the Tony gets taken in by this other higher kingpin and eventually he takes him down and claims it as his own. Al Pacino just takes it all. Like, he's... It's it's the most rated R 80s film you ever see because it's got a lot of swearing and bullets. It's got uh, it's it's got Al Pacino nearly making love to his sister. Yeah, pretty close. Yeah. Um, you know stuff you really want to see. Yeah, I mean, god damn, it's just his sister was hot. Whoa. That was a, that was like a first uh, role in a film the actress I can't be her name but the the two deaths the, 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 the climax of both films are different because the first film it wasn't a bunch of gangsters or a bunch of other gangs trying to gang up in him and kill him it's a bunch of these police and um trying to kill him and it, it wasn't very graceful he was on the he uh was trying to get go down the steps and out of his house and walk out the door and all of a sudden he just dead in the remake they uh Oh, it's the most epic climax ever. And he's like, oh. he's like, you want to play rough? Okay. Say hello to my little friend. And they start gunfighting all over the place, and he gets shot from behind, falls in the pool. Very, it's very quotable too. The remake actually, just a lot of quotable lines. By the way, spoiler alert. Sorry for mm-hmm. anybody who wanted to see the movie. This would die. Spoiler alert. He says, "Say hello to my little friend." At the- and then dies in a pool, in case you missed that part. The, the other thing I noticed between the two... Don't spoil it. Don't say that it's in a pool. I didn't see it <laughs> no. yet. No. <laughs> oh, no, boy. he didn't die. They brought him back to life for a video game. Oh, no, it's exactly. Not the... <laughs> Do I want to mention I, I had the PlayStation Portable game? Oh my god, the disc is so tiny. <laughs> it's so tiny, I man. I tiny. used to have a... Man. Oh, yeah, those I, PSP so, discs. PSP, man, PSP. I, uh, yeah, yeah I... That, uh, that game, that looks so <laughs> small. Uh. <laughs> they, yeah, it was interesting how they brought him back in the game. It's just like, oh, after he's dead, he gets res- resurrected, and he has to do the whole thing all over again, which is like, okay. In purgatory or something? I have no idea. I can't remember how he came back to life. I don't remember. It's been a while, but... I, it was like a Grand Theft Auto style of game, and so. But the other thing I noticed was um, in both films they have the the, yeah. the thing that motivates Tony, and it's the the quote, "The world is yours." Like that does his motivation. Like someday that's gonna be mine. The world's gonna be mine someday. Um, in the original, he sees it from a sign outside of of his uh, building. But in the remake, um, it's all it's plastered all over the place. It's on a blimp. He sees it at first, and then when he capitalizes, like the world is mine? Yeah, yeah, there's a blimp. There's a blimp that goes yeah. by, and it says "The world is yours," and it's by Pan Am. Mm-hmm. Oh. So. Oh yeah. yeah. It's like it's, he says, "You told him I'm gonna get him in the movie." He's like, he says, "Hey man, hey, just the one says, hey, Tony, what do you want?'" Man says, "The world, Chico, and everything in it." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And that he took those words to go because Tony Montana, he. When he gets, you know, the money and he get in that montage, the montage of getting all the money, uh, 80s montage. It'll just be a montage. That's called Push, a montage. Push it to the limit. It was like the weirdest moment for a montage is seeing the rise of Tony Montana after he kills off his former boss. He's like, yep, screw you, man. I gotta get out of my own. And just mm-hmm. the, the montage plays, and you see him the rise. You know, he has a couple of buildings like traveling. You see a bank, and uh, his sister gets a beauty uh, beauty salon, and then 
you see his mansion and you see a little like statue and it says it's like a globe and it says the world is yours and I was like oh okay they do pay homage to the original film it's like the remake is so much better oh, yes. than the original like straight out of Cuba yes <laughs> I yes love it. it's so quotable like how do you get that scar in pussy <laughs> <laughs> there is so many quotable uh, stuff in Scarface. It's so amazing. It and, is. Um, and, you know, and the funny thing is, when you look at it, it was not, you know, received well. It was not. I think uh, some stars didn't like it. I think Lucille Ball hated it. Dustin Hoffman fell asleep during it. Um, and oh, I yeah. think um, writers Kurt Von the Gut and John Irving, they walked out. And said, you know, they were just disgusted from the uh, the notorious chainsaw scene. Yes, yes, yeah, the chainsaw. But that, yeah, but that was one of the key reasons why why um, Brian De Palma wanted to keep that that scene in there because he's he's quoted as saying, and and yes, this is a variation on a on a meme that I saw earlier today. I couldn't find the right one, so I just made my own right now and. Sent it out to you guys. I just made one, James. You know that on my Facebook, I made one. Oh, that was yours. Yeah, that was mine. That was yours. Oh, <laughs> I was looking for it. I was like, okay, well, show the show the audience, show our viewing audience your version. Uh, hold on, let me pull it up. We'll see yes. Which looks better. Yeah, it's yours really is better. True. I think yours yeah, is better. That just looks more badass, yeah. though. Even though yeah, just asked him it did. Know, he just took. While we're on the while we're on the subject of quotable lines from the film, Which I have one? to mention my favorite line. I kill communists just for fun, but for a green card, I oh, slice real good. Okay. I think of <laughs> yes. other ones like um. He says this town is like a. No, well, now I'm trying. I'm. I had the TV at it in my the original in my head, so I'm trying to get the right one out. That this. It's like a yeah. Pussy this whole town is to there's, there's a great big push and waiting yeah. to get fucked. And it, it, there's a this this DVD by the way. It's a Platinum Edition I have, and it, the bonus features are amazing. They have a documentary like short about the TV edit, and the whoever did the T I forgot the name who did the TV edit, but he tried to replace the lines and the, all the violence cut out. It was the the TV edit was like Drish Town Man is like a big chicken just just waiting to get plucked. <laughs> hilarious <laughs> that is just yeah I, I'm, um, I'm not surprised uh, the other one still, um, still won't be what they did with uh, snakes yes, on plane but this is like I'm tired of these I mean I think snakes these mother freaking snakes on this mother freaking no. plane no it's worse monkey biting snakes monkey biting on this through Friday on this Monday yeah, to Friday good. plane wow they had, they had Sam Jackson no, say that I think so, yeah, to dub it, yeah, probably. He was just like, oh, I, that doesn't sound like Yeah, I think uh, James is way better than mine, actually. You have the classic pose. I have the, just the pose of him sitting down, so... James wins! <laughs> Yay, yeah, I win what money. What's that beaming? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> no, the other line they did in the TV ad of Scarface was, How'd you get that scar, eating pineapple? <laughs> <laughs> what? That is... what was he eating the shell outside the pineapple? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then the scar. <laughs> but I, I thought you were supposed to just be able to take a bite out of an apple, you know? It's like, well, it's a pineapple, but they didn't tell me it was hard so, on the outside. Scarf. I wanted to get the doll whip. It didn't work out well. So Scarface is actually a really good adaptation or remake of the original. They, they kind of modernize it, make it contemporary, the 80s contemporary, you know, make it, you know, because it was all about Cubans and Castro and something political kind of thing related. And Florida. Yeah. Florida yeah it, and such. This is oh, before stuff. Miami Vice, too, which might, might, be, might be influential for the show, too, so it was just like, whoa, seeing Miami, uh, 80s Miami, who best thing. Yeah, and also, it's a yes. long film. Yes, I was... Like, Three it's hours. yeah close to I think it's uh, two hour, two hours and fifty minutes yeah so but the original is like an hour and thirty minutes so which is that's why 
it was easier to watch that and just it was quick it was a very quick setup for the original like the original doesn't it just click, clickety split like he you see tony come in it's like uh hey no oh, wait hold on it's he's italian hey man uh i can't do italian accent right now fuck hey man he, hey man he, he comes out of just to get a little bit of a bounce at the, the, the end of every he, syllable. He comes out of nowhere, you know, and he's like, hey, there's, there's Tony, he's Italian. Uh, and it's like, oh, hey, I'm working for this guy. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm killing people. Yeah, my machine guns. Da, 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 da. Oh, my sister's here. Oh, you know, all that stuff. And then, oh, boom, 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 bam. It was like quick. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's way too fast. Slow down. I mean, it's, it's a good, it's a good classic film if you want to go back that far to see the classics and the remake if you love the 80s as much as I do you'll probably love it too and I just thought of a great parody of Scarface Scarface mm -hmm. Scarface Lion yes it's something yeah. really Lion good. King yes I well <laughs> could you eh, well, that's could you? Thing. you know I watched that stuff you know I watched Alien and uh, Gremlins, Critters, yeah. uh, I think um, <laughs> Alien 3. Uh, my dad rented these things when I was a kid, by the way. So, That's cool. You know, um, <laughs> I, think, I think I snuck in to watch Scarface 2, so yep. Man, I don't that remember was, that much. It's rated gold. I mean, the bonus feature on the feature film discs is a, is a scorecard, so you can watch the film, and it'll count how many bullets are shot and how many times he swears, or anytime anybody swears. And this is before YouTubers started counting shit and uploading on YouTube. It's great. It's mm. just like you watch the end. It's like, holy, oh, said that many swears and that many bullets are shot. Yeah, I think it's like one of the movies that said the most like swear so, words. Or yeah, because like it's a very like it's high. Like it's, it's up there with up Goodfellas. There. It's it's really uh good, but uh, another another eighties uh, film that got remade. Uh, there's two of them we're going to talk about tonight, but, uh, first one we're going to talk about is RoboCop. Ah, uh, yes, RoboCop. Um, I remember watching, oh, this is another thing I watched as a kid. Oh, the violence, oh, the parody, oh, the everything that was so much in, uh, RoboCop. It was like, oh, man. You know, you, it was almost everything you could have wanted in the, in the movie and such. It was... Um, I mean, the characters were likable. Um, the villain was hateable. The violence was extreme. Dark Everything blood. is, yes, yeah, so much blood. And honestly, to me, this is like you know what they just took down Murphy. It, even if I never saw, I mean, never saw the movie again or something. I just saw the first movie, mm -hmm. the original one, like a couple of days ago, and I still remember beat by beat by beat. The way that he comes in, the way he goes down. I mean, shh. I mean, the we the uh, just the way that Alex Murphy gets taken out, just like <laughs> you just like says like, oh ah e ah oh I just like, <laughs> you know, you just felt like yeah, it was all this other you know, you felt that you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. You felt that you 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 felt every bullet, everything else there, and you know. And I love the fact that, um, honestly, I like the fact in the 80s, a lot of people want to say the 80s was terrible, but you had a RoboCop, you had the, um, <laughs> you uh, had a strong female partner who wasn't a love interest mm -hmm. and such. I mean, how many times have we been saying that? It's just, um, you had, um, you know, you know, A. and Lewis just became <laughs> just really much a, a badass and such. You know, she helped oh, she take down the... Sorry, what? Oh, go ahead. Well, she didn't technically become a love interest until uh, RoboCop 3, but there's... <laughs> yeah. Uh, we yeah, don't talk but about no. that. It's a bit of a guilty player. We got RoboCop flying in this. You know, I was a kid, I liked that. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but honestly, RoboCop to me just really said was really good the comedy was on point and such and you really felt that you know, Peter, uh, was yeah, Peter, Peter Weller. Weller really did just a great job of you know really showing the humanity of Alex Murphy but also the coldness of uh, Robocop and um, 
you know, the funniness part of the, the Ed 209, just killing that one guy, you know, in the beginning of the movie, just, you know, they're that trying to set insane. it up. <laughs> yeah, and, um, oh boy. And the remake, uh, I'll get to that in a minute, you know, everything else, but I'm, let's continue uh, talking about the greatness that is Robocop. It was, um, again, uh, the characters was uh, lovable. I love the fact you had, um, uh, yeah, you know, you had the, the villain just, you know, you know the, the dad. I think it was the dad from uh, that 70s show. Kurt Wood. Kurt Wood. <laughs> yes. He's my favorite part of the movie, I know. you guys. He's, I love him in everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Kurt Wood Smith. And I love that the gang just took him out. And then, like I said, it just built all this other stuff. And, um... Um, again, even when you had the, um, um, you know, the ending, you know, you had Robocop not only took out the gang that took him out, but also he took out that one guy. He's like, you know, I can't do anything because, you know, that fourth directive. I can't attack no um, OCP guy. And then um, the, the CEO says, Dick, you're fired. And he says, both like, thank you. Blast him out, just, like take him out, and just um, have him fall. And just, just to me, like that's how you take out a villain. I'm like, yes, it's that, too. that, that's how you take that guy out. You don't see that much in movies nowadays. Uh, but then again, that was to me probably one of the best things. That just you know, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect movie or 80s movie because and such. But Robocop, honestly, it felt like it fit all these other things. You know. It says, mm-hmm. someone says it's the best film in 1987. You know what? I can't yeah, argue with actually, that. Yeah, actually, yeah, I can agree with that too, actually. But then, if it's not the best, then it's definitely one of the most memorable. Yes. But then the remake happened. <laughs> uh, the remake. 49% you know, rotten. Yeah. It's a half love and half hated. I can see there was some good stuff here. Um, you know, the suit looks kind of interesting. I like the suit. The motorcycle looks really cool. The new setup for Robocop uh, looks, like I said, looks sleek. Uh, the new suit, even though, why does he have that left arm? You know, the hand, human hand here, I have no idea why. So why does he look cut... more like Batman than, than Robocop? <laughs> yeah, I, I still don't know why. They... I love the fact in the 87 one, he says... Why do you have the um the hand here? Well, we can save it. No, cut the hand off and we get both robot hands. I have no idea why you have, um, again, why does he have a human hand there? So we can still no. have some feelers. <laughs> no, that he has the human side because subtle symbolism is for movies with smart audiences. Yeah. Anyway, but um, everything else, you know, you have um. You, you have some good actors here. You had uh, yeah. Gary Oldman, uh, Michael Keaton, Keaton, Jackie O'Haley, uh, Samuel Jackson. You know, some really good stuff, but it just doesn't work. Samuel Jackson is, you know, the dude just, you know, being, well, Sam Bill Jackson O'Reilly. Was he had no point. He just stood around on green screen, occasionally exposited. That's what it is. He was the guy who just did exposition. That was it. And, um, yeah. <laughs> they tried so hard to ape the whole, you know, the 80s type of parody stuff, but... We all hear what's going on. Hello? They didn't do anything with it. It was just, a, the whole movie felt just dry and lifeless. And speaking of lifeless, you know how they get rid of Alex Murphy in this thing? They mm. didn't kill him off. They didn't do anything. Remember, you know what? Eh, car blows up. Boom. That's oh. it. That's no it. gangs. No nothing. Completely bloodless or anything else. Just boom. I saw it. I remember I saw this in the trailer. I was like, yeah, that's going to be that type of movie. And it's rated PG-13, right? Yep, there it yep, is, right yep, there. PG-13, <laughs> the the rating you love to hate sometimes when it comes to remakes of rated R films. Yeah, 
I mean, they did not, you know, I don't want, you know, uh, the guy who does uh, Cecil uh, from a good, uh, good bad flex said something about this video about uh, PG-13. Yep, and just, and honestly, dude is right. This movie just really just screams that if it was more gritty and really gone that far, because it had some good ideas, you know, having him, the illusion of free will with the movie. I think Gary Oldman, the doctor, put that stuff in his brain and such. But then the idiotic thing of um, it was Joe Kinnaman, the guy who plays Alex Murphy, who was robotic before he became Robocop, just, I have, I'm honestly, you barely see anything from, um, uh, you know, Peter Reller from the original. You don't see family life, but the, the stuff that you see, a bit of him, you see that he was actually full of life and everything else. Here, in the, in the, the remake, he was just so lifeless and just like gritty and so realistic. And I'm like, dude, you, you are a super cop and you're just you're like, mm, yes, no, blah. I, I, that was the entire thing. I just could not, <laughs> I couldn't really get behind him. And then they turned uh, one of the more interesting female protagonists in the 1987 film. Heck, you could say if there was like 1980s female protagonists up there, um, Lewis, exactly, uh, Ann Lewis was probably right up there. They just turned her into a black dude, random black dude that doesn't really do much. And if you want to do something with the Ann Lewis, you would, you'd say you need a person of color, why not have a black woman there? How about have uh, Rosie O'Dawson there? You know, someone wasn't like that. Making it a person of color. The point was making it a dude. They yeah. made Anne and Andy. Because yeah. Fuck women, am I right? Yeah, so but on. but it's just the, the 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 problem with this whole thing, which um, I really did not like, is that he didn't really do much. Um, he did nothing that really was, but really just like you know. Any other cop in the story could do. He would just show. I feel like he would just shoot in there. Like, see, we're progressive. We're we're a part of a story, even though he's just there. He doesn't really do much. Only thing he does in the movie is actually take down uh, Jack and Earl Haley. That's pretty much it. Is I'm Jack like, Haley, the, see, I don't really remember Jack and Earl Haley's character in the movie. Was he like he the was, gangster? No, no, he's not the gangster, which I think it should have been. Which, by the way, the guy who um, organized the hit on um, Alex Murphy, the, um, I think, who was it? Uh, who, I don't even remember the dude's name. It was, uh, um, oh, Anton Valen. Um, dude just looked just bland and boring. That would have been better if it was him. Because Jackie Hurl Haley was actually really fun uh, as a, you know, somewhat evident antagonist. But he didn't. He just, um,. Uh, yeah, uh, Rick Maddox. He was a trainer. That's what he was. So, yes, yeah. I gave it I, so much yeah, so, um, in fact, you see, another thing I didn't like is that, you know, it's, um, the doctor, like I said earlier, they said we implore things like he just, the raw taste control. It says he, the illusion of free will. But nope, it comes out that he was, um, finding it off because, you know, the human soul and spirit is, Magic and such. It yeah, I really magic. know that. Yeah, because you know, friendship is magic. Heart of the cards, something. <laughs> and by the way, Robocop is magic. <laughs> I think it would have been better, but um, yeah. Anyone want to draw draw that? That'd be just hilarious. But um, um, the Ed Two Hundred Nines, um, they missed the point of the complete machine entirely. They made them competent killing machines. I'm like, no. They are, you know, they're incompetent. They don't know what between friend or foe. It's like, no, you, you don't understand what you're doing with this. These, the, the Ed 209s were incompetent. They didn't know what they're doing. They, were just, they shoot and kill everybody. And they messed that up. I'm like, how can you mess up the main thing about the Ed 209s? But it seems like they watch half of the movie and maybe the end, like, I feel like they just watch half of the original Robocop and they're like, um, and the other half is like, okay, we don't watch only like, no, not half, but 
bits and pieces of the original Robocop and said, eh, that's okay, we'll just, we'll just uh, fill up with that other stuff. But, yeah, it just feels like um, nothing in this movie is just really interesting or engaging. They have a lot of ideas, but they all fall flat. So, in fact, I just forgot most of the things, uh, the movie out there. I, I, there's nothing really, it's a generic movie. It's I was going to say, I was going to say there was one thing that I, sorry, but I, I didn't know you were about to say it's worth Go on. ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The one thing I, that I liked about the remake was um, some, of the cha- some of the changes in regards to Alex Murphy's personal life. I liked uh, I, when, in the original RoboCop, when he comes, when he, uh, uh, when he uh, wakes up as a robot, he has no, no memory of his previous life. And he figures that out as the story goes on, but his family's out of the picture. In the remake, I thought it was, was a, an interesting touch to retain his memories somehow, but at at least try to see what it was like to reincorporate him into his family life. Yeah, but they don't really do much with it. I feel like it's just there, but they're just shut it to the side. Again... If they were really important to the story, they would have more of a presence there. It just feels like, okay, you have a little bit of presence, but we have a training sequence they have to go through. They have a little bit of presence, then, okay, he becomes a full RoboCop, and he goes to chase down criminals. He, they have little presence. And then to the end, they just become like, okay, we have to save the family now. They weren't really a main part of the story, which, to me, is the worst thing about this. And no, the worst thing about this movie is that, you know, even worse, it's generic. And I can say, even the worst sequels, Robocop 2 and Watcher, there's something memorable about them. You can easily take away something positive or negative. There's something there. This, I just watched this yesterday, and I'm like, there's nothing that sticks to me. That, that That's the real sin about this movie. There's nothing that will stick with you after the first, like, t- after 24 hours. It's gone. Nothing sticks mm-hmm. with you. No real uh, positive. Just it's just a bland movie that just is dark, gritty, trying to be like Batman, but fails immediately. If it if it was even a good version of what it is, it fails like that. Like a certain other movie that just came out recently and such. Mm-hmm. See, first of all, that's the worst thing about this movie, about the remake of RoboCop is that there is absolutely no Clarence Boddicker equivalent at all. There is neat, there's no, there's some kind of bad guys that aren't like the freaking Michael Keaton corporate jerk, but they're not really important. There's no Kirkwood Smith, there's no gangsters that kill Robocop and then he has to like go on a revenge quest against them. There's none of that. And that was the best part of the movie. That was the oh. main conflict. But they couldn't yeah. make that the main conflict because this was not
You take away the cool badass female cop, replace her with a semi-cool badass male cop who doesn't do much, and then focus on the doting, worried, sentimental white stereotype who's there to, you know, try to, to appeal to Robocop's moral side because she loves him and then get kidnapped and so he has to save her because that's, you know, that's a much better choice for a female lead, right? What was her name again? Who cares? She had blonde hair. Woman. 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 But, you know, uh, even the worst thing about the robot career is the gun they have him. It's not a gun. It's a taser. I'm like, did they not even know anything about Robocop that big PC had? What? I know he has two other semi-automatic guns, but that was his main gun. He didn't need any like, semi-automatics. He had that big old pistol that took everybody mm-hmm. out. He rarely used anything else. He just took like this. He just said, like, hello, boom, took everybody out with that. He even had some trick shots, you know, he was like, zzz, boom. At- this, he just like, okay, um, just tase everybody, tase all the things, and then do. And yeah, people saying PG 13s are more bloody and more violent than rated R stuff back in the 80s. Back in the 80s. I'm like, <sighs> because Robocop can't kill people, otherwise, how can we support him and believe he has a heart and soul? At, uh, because don't tase me, bro. At, I'm surprised they didn't go with the the animated series route with Robocop is uh, with lasers. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, don't, forget the, don't, don't forget the chief. <laughs> By the way, that too. Robocop. I need Robocop. Robocop. By the way, By the way, that's also why the AK-47s weren't like totally incompetent because they had no humanity, and that is enough for them to be evil. Because this movie has friggin' Care Bears mentality, but in a badass Batman way. Because we're not lame, guys. We're not lame like the 80s. We're cool. They're trying to be cool. Yet we're cool with a heart of gold, but we're cool. <laughs> Such skewed yeah. priorities. <laughs> So I'd rather, after this, I'd rather watch the uh, Robocop animated series. Yes. At that point. I was like, at least that actually. <laughs> That's pretty much what we were referring to with the Killdozer and Devil Woman, I named Robocop. Yes, yes. I was going to say that this is like the third time we talked about Robocop on this podcast. So clearly, we love Lo- Robocop that much. Trust me, yes. the animated series is just something you got to love. It's like, it's, it's like one of those so bad, it's just yes. lovable. You can't hate it for something this stupid. So. Oh, yes. Uh, but also, there was another one, Alpha Command. I remember watching we, that back in the day. That. So. that was a TV yeah, that's, show, right? Yeah, there was two live-action TV shows that was produced in uh, Canada. Oh, yeah. And then they need two cartoons. Which is funny, because they make cartoons out of probably yes. one of the most violent... We do and... <laughs> that, that, Exactly. I'm like, yeah, how are you going to... It's probably one of the most violent... Uh, 80s villain. Let me say this: 80s uh, heroes. Think I wonder what the body count would be. Robocop. Um, let's see, uh, let's see, uh, who's else? Uh, let's see. Oh, um, yeah. Rambo. Who had the higher body count? Yeah. Yeah, that's a new look. I mean, like I said in the show, they replaced the bullets with lasers. So pew 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 pew. pew. Um, I you know what? I forgot to mention. Which is the whole point I brought up, Scarface, was uh, they're actually doing another remake of Scarface. Oh, uh, they're actually going to not remake. I think they were going to actually have a no, sequel. No, I, I read that. How could they have a I sequel? I read that. That's old news. That was back in the 2000s where some rapper guy was going to do a, a sequel called Son of Tony, and that was totally scrapped. And now they're going to do a, a new remake, um, and it's going to be set... Of course, in current days, and it's going to be a Mexican going into Los Angeles. So, and, and then and it, the, um, they uh, they said they'd take both elements from the original film and the '83 remake. So, at least they're trying to pay homage to the original films, and so. Uh, yeah, well, allegedly, so was Robocop. <laughs> they didn't look at the source material, Dan. They just they... like, hey, look, audience, we actually do show the original suit. One scene where we talk about the Isn't that great? <laughs> oh, Robocalf. We love ya. Robocalf? I did say Robocalf. Robocalf. Cap. 
<laughs> Robo calf. Well, now that's something. Robo calf in your ass. Calf. <laughs> mm. Sounds like Go maybe ahead. the like the new New York version. We need Robo calf. I mean, I, I, that's just Boston, you mean? That was oh, Boston. Boston. Yeah, Boston. Boston. But uh. In Boston. <laughs> Jay's boy cast, we get attacked by a Robocap. You know how Robocop takes place in the future? Yeah. This is what year it takes place in? 2015. No, actually, the original one supposed to take place in 2020. <laughs> 2015, maybe it was changed later on in later DVD cuts. Hmm. Well, then we really are just uh, late then. I don't know. Have you been to Detroit? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the original was in 2020. The remake, let's see. I, they, did, they did set it like in the far future, I believe. Hold on. Let me look this up here. Why not just Mega Man in 20? Oh, no. It was eight years. 20. 2028. So, so, oh. so the original is 2020, and the, this one's 2028. I was close. I was close. Eight years in the future. That's that's great, Robocop remake. You've really got a button on what things are going to be like in 15 years. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, going to 80s, let's go back a decade or so to the 70s, where Stephen Stephen King had a little book slash film called Carrie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about Carrie. Sorry, what, Gator? Sorry, never mind. You're a little pixelated. Oh. But how am I now? James is the best, James. <laughs> how am I now? Okay, so... Carrie, the 1970s film, is a classic horror story about a very introverted and shy girl who finds out that she has telekinetic powers, but she is, she is spoiler alert, uh, picked on by the, the student body to the point where she just decides to go ahead and uh, uh, massacre the whole, the whole the whole school. So, um... As you do. Yeah, like you do. do. Like you do. And... So, it was... It, it was, uh... I, I think a, a classic for many reasons. I look back on it and I, I, I don't think it's as, as scary as when I first saw it. Which, you know, not everything usually is, but the... I, I can at least go back and look at it and identify why it was scary. And it, not scary, carry. Ooh. So, they... Scary? Mm-hmm. I, thought it was, I thought it was creepy, carry. But they <laughs> called her. Yeah, the... Yeah, but the scary rhymes. So... Oh. I'm being Thanks clever. They are. So... In the in the many years that followed, it uh, it had actually been remade several times. Um, we're not oh, we're not each Terry two. Terry two wasn't Terry two uh, wasn't all that bad, but you had, in my opinion at least, but it kind of destroys. The, the lore that set up with the first film. So, yeah, I, I can I can forgive Stephen King for hating it. Um, but, um, no, actually, I thought I'd give a real brief submit, mention to a few things. One, I know we don't do Broadway shows, but um, the, I'm going to give the uh, 1980s Carrie Broadway musical a bit of an honorable mention here for <laughs> for singing a song about Cracker Jacks while while spilling a pig's blood. What? Okay, there has uh, to be some video or DVD of this. Please tell me. This yes, 
it 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 exists. It it it's quite amazing. They uh they they uh they had Debbie Harry doing the the dance choreography and what? to be honest the the catchiness of the music is it's not all that bad but gosh darn it this this production was full of problems. Um, if you want to see it, uh, here's a link for later. Oh, dear God. All right. And, well, something I'm going to be doing mm-hmm. later. Oh, yeah. Uh, who cares about sleep, right? Fuck sleep. Sleep, what is that? And, not to mention another one of my favorite screw-ups, uh, the, they had troubles in the, in the second act of the production when it came to the spilling of the pig's blood on Carrie, because it would always short out her shirt microphone. Oh, oh right. Dear. So, whoopsie. Whoopsie daisy. But, and. Then, They're all then, not going to hear you. And in 2002, it was remade as a TV movie, two parts. Wasn't it? Wait. Yeah, yeah you're right, mm-hmm. yeah. I was just gonna say there was a se- there was a Which, sequel, wasn't there? Yeah, we mentioned the sequel when you were getting your drink okay, there. Thanks. Just double checking. Um, they had a TV movie, which, uh, from what I could tell, um, from what I could tell, actually is more of trying to be a close interpretation of the book by taking a lot more of the book's elements, and I have not read the book. Consider me a bit of a charlatan there because I'm supposed to be the guy who reads the books and the movies. I have not read this book, so don't quote me on that. But uh, this movie does have, this version of it does have certain things the 70s movie didn't have, like meteorites. Um, Yeah. Where did that come from? Yeah, well, you just um, have to see the movie to find out. They're all going to extinct the dinosaurs. Is that the only quote you have, Matt? How how do you extinct something? Is that is extincting now a, a verb? Yes. <laughs> you verbed yes, it. Yes, I declare it a verb now. But where the where the. Uh, where the 2002 film TV movie fails is it was actually meant to be a spin up. It was actually meant to yeah, be back a door, pilot for yeah, a TV Yeah, Backdoor Pilot 2 for a possible TV series. That was by NBC, I believe they did that. So, a carry spoiler series. alert, some people. Yeah. Spoiler alert, some people who died in the uh, finale actually live here. So. Uh, and then we have the 2013 14. Carrie starring. It came out last year. Where you had um, um what's that? Uh, what's it, um, who was that? Um, uh, you had that girl from Kickass playing Carrie. Carrie. Oh Williams. yeah. And uh, who was her mother? I can't remember. Jamie Lee Curtis. What? Julianne oh, Moore. Oh. Oh, Julianne Moore. Sorry. That would have been interesting <laughs> though, wouldn't it? Jamie that Lee would Curtis. be actually. Wow. Interesting idea there. Yeah, I have the, some. The whole, also, uh, the only thing I remember from the trailer was her banging her head like this, like, boom, boom, like some sad, hard, you know, metal head or something. I'm like, it was like, yeah, that's. Yep. And it's that's gonna be at forty eight percent run run tomatoes, a a a a a a a percentage higher than RoboCop remake. Thanks for that, Jeff. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. Uh, 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 I 48%. No, that wasn't the global, that was Southern. Never mind. This is a... This is a very rare case of a film. Such as? Because... In the sense that... They went out of the way to... To virally promote this movie in so many different ways. Oh, yeah. And yeah. every bit of viral promotion for this thing was scarier than the actual film. I remember yes. that. That was good viral marketing. That, that I mean, they had a phone number you could call Carrie, and I remember calling up, uh, doing that. I, I actually called up Carrie, my 
myself, and it was a machine on the other end. Of, of course, spoiler okay. alert. They had uh, they had a video where they had a Facebook app where you could be you walking through Carrie's house, breaking in, entering, and then you get you get spotted and you run out of there. Yeah, I remember the. I remember there was even a place. Yes, I was thinking about that one. Where, yeah, they were pretty much coffee, they were in this like, coffee cafe shop, or and stuff like, yeah, and this coffee shop. And, and a girl and, like, like Carrie this comes girl comes in, like, and she had psychic power. So they had it all set up where it was all there was behind the scenes where they had everything set up behind scenes where strings and everything. So every time she was like pissed off or screams, everything like moves away, and she's like, ah! and people got freaked out by it. It was hilarious. I was. I would have loved to have been in that 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 cafe. Yeah, just see know? people freak out like who are not in, in on the prank. Man, I wouldn't mm-hmm. have freaked out. I would have. I would have wanted to be your friend. Like, hey, you got sick flowers. Of course you would. I know some. Well, that's you before. Try to pull well, that's off. Be- <laughs> well, uh, that's before. Like, make sure you don't get hit by a chair in the process. Yeah, it was, it was chairs, mm-hmm. and there was like a bookshelf that fell down. It was like crazy. They wouldn't like together a prank that could actually hurt people. Because then you get Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and then the... And then the actual movie comes uh-huh. out. Uh-huh. And... <laughs> you think about it. It... It's not scary at all. Uh... But it... In my book, it could have been... It could have been a passable sequel up until, the, up until a certain point. And, and I'm hearing myself talk right now, so... Uh, okay, there there we go. Um, see, what made the original effective... What made the original movie effective was that the... That the title character was, from, from the get-go, uh, portrayed as being a very frail and afraid character... And that's why that's why everybody picks on her, and that's why I think the the film is relatable because who's who didn't get picked on here? Who didn't get picked on? It was twenty thirteen. Never mind, I was wrong. You're right. Okay. Exactly. And so this this makes the the finale of the film. Uh, interesting in so many different ways because for me watching the the film first time it was it it was payoff to a degree and yet you know you're uh, you're kind of you're kind of partially rooting for Carrie as she makes a makes an omelet out of her out of her classmates <laughs> but at the same time but at the same time, you're kind of realizing to yourself, this is wrong, so what am I rooting for? Maybe if you're a pansy ass. I was, well, that was pretty hard. I, I was, it, it, it's kind of a, it's kind of a very guilty pleasure moment. You should be getting pleasure out of, out of it, but you feel guilty at the same time. Like, that, that's why I found it creepy. Um... The film, the the remake, does this all completely backwards. She's not a frail character from the get-go. She's, you know, her her mom's trying to pick on her with all of her craziness and the Bible says this and whatnot and you should be a you should be a, a good little girl and whatnot or I'm gonna punish you. And in the remake, the She's fighting back against her mother, saying, "No, the Bible does not say this, and you should be ashamed." And yada yada yada. And it, it kind of, while it it seems like a more it, it does seem more like a modern teenager to fight back against their parents. That's not what. That's not what made the original film. Frightening. Carrie was never a normal teenager. She was. She clearly oh. had. And due to her mm-hmm. state, this whole like making her sassy and shit in the name of you know strong independent woman. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's. 
I don't think it's really strong independent woman. It's more strong independent teenager. Yeah. Because they like they want to see make... teen, they want to they want to see like teenagers fight back their parents. It's like yeah, we're not gonna take orders from our parents. We're gonna be independent. Carrie was never supposed to be an inspirational role model. She was supposed to like tap into, you know, what teenagers felt insecure about. She was supposed to be tragic. Well, it ain't gonna mm -hmm. stop filmmakers to try it anyways. They have to, well, they, I guess they have to try something different for a remake, but it kind of sucks it out. And the changes continue. There, there's actually one, there's actually one em emphasis that the, uh, that the remake does that I kind of sort of liked, and I'll get to that. But, um... One of the one of the first times I saw the original film was uh, in uh, in a college classroom setting in which the professor's uh, professor's thesis on the film was uh, to was to basically try and prove that uh, Stephen King had some sort of vendetta against women. Oh, um, wow. Um, to to the credit of the first film, I I noticed that um, the the main girls who are who are out to seek revenge on Carrie for some bullshit that happens at the beginning of the film, that's their fault, and they deserve to be they deserve to be punished for it. Um, they're just straight up bitchy, and you're you're kind of like okay. We're not going to side with these characters, period. But then they they get their boyfriends and on this revenge act. One of the boyfriends, played by uh, a young John Travolta, pre Grease. Yeah, that's what I thought, actually. Yeah. yeah. And and the boyfriends are kind of playing along with it, like they're indifferent and whatnot. Well, the the remake turns this around. The girls do initiate the idea of revenge, but they're they're much more sympathetic bullies now. And their boyfriends are whipping out knives and they're crazy motherfuckers. And they're like, yeah, we're gonna go kill a pig, man. Oh, I'm like, I'm because like, what? reasons. Because reasons. Yeah. When it so, comes to... Hmm? Carrie is made less frail and mentally ill and more sassy. And the bullies are made less evil and more hapless valley girls. They they think they're they're making this better in terms of like female portrayals, but what they're actually doing is a lot worse than that. They're okay. doing more harm than good. Yeah, they're portraying like the freaking valley girls as stupid and causing harm without realizing it, and they're portraying like our lone Carrie as you know not like other girls. And they're turning it into this tired thing when it wasn't that. But we have mm -hmm. to make everything really late so that it will work in our feeble little Hollywood brains. Uh, the one, the one point that I that I will that I will give the remake for, and that um, throughout the story, uh, yeah. Carrie gains she she gains a friend. Uh, or shall I say, an acquaintance, a girl who, um, a girl who uh, feels guilty for embarrassing uh, Carrie at the beginning of the film. She decides to make it up to her by letting her, letting Carrie go to the go to the prom with her, with her boyfriend. Now this wasn't too much. This was very uh, evenly emphasized in the original, but it's a lot more emphasized in the remake, the, the type of sacrifice that this girl is making for Carrie. And because, because she's saying, you know, this is what, you know, I never thought much about senior prom. I never went to mine. But I understand that for a lot of people that it's kind of a big mm -hmm. deal. This is in their in their young lives, this is a big stepping out moment and whatnot, and they they emphasize that in the 
in the remake, but um, it it goes every it goes downhill in every which way uh, since uh, it it possibly can from there on out. You know, we have uh, uh, when the when the climactic when the climactic scene happens between Carrie and, you know, killing everybody else, she does, she, uh, she does a few things that are, that really sort of get a little bit under the skin. She, she spares the PE teacher, um, which I, I suppose was cool because, you know, the PE teacher was nice to her. Um, but uh, she uh, uh, she she laments over over this uh, one night boyfriend that uh, I don't get it. How does somebody die getting hit in the head with a bucket? <laughs> um, maybe it was the bucket it, of death. It's symbolic Empty. of something. Concussion. Maybe maybe it was a bucket of nails. On the outside. No, it was. It it had all the it had all the blood poured out of it by that point. It was empty. Was it plastic or metal? So, or wooden? Metal. Well, of course. It, it well, was a metal bucket. If you think about it, yeah, I know we're taking way too much into this, but if you think about you know the velocity of how fast the bucket is going and the way she telepathically throws it at him, you know, you get a concussion from it. If if she didn't, no, it didn't. She didn't throw the bucket at him. It it fell from the ceiling. Or maybe it's, it's just that he has a very empty. thin head. And that tells you that I have not seen the that, remake. That so. would explain why he's the worst actor in the film. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I'm I'm not buying it either way. And then she goes home. Spoiler alert: There's. A face-off between her and her mother, like the original movie, and she oh, uses her lesson. special. Yeah, she uses her special powers to throw knives at her mother and sort of symbolically crucify her against the against the doorway. Um, how did they ruin this? How did they ruin this? Yes. Well, they ruined it by not setting it up properly by having her be victimized constantly by her mother. Oh, it gets even better. Oh, okay. It gets even better. Oh, dear. This... They try to add in a jump scare. Yay, jump scares. So, Carrie walks up to her mother. mother. Carrie walks up to her mother after she's been stabbed to make sure that she's dead, I guess. And then Julianne Moore just goes, "No!" Thanks for that. Yeah. That that added a lot. But and honestly, it's, it's the modern it is the modern Hollywood scares because we need jump scares. I mean, uh, I'm sitting yeah. in the audience with uh, with my buddy LT watching this. And right when that happened, we, we both saw that coming. We both saw it coming, but when it happened, he just reached over and grabbed my leg. I tried, <laughs> tried to scare the shit out of me, and I'm just sitting there like, aww. Wasn't that exact same type of jump scare you did read for Madness the Musical? That's all I can think of is when the one dude like goes on the scarecrow thing, and it looks like he's dead, and then he pops up and goes, Rah! <laughs> But then it was played for laughs, you know, because mm -hmm. it's a stupid jump scare. Oh my god. Just, say, just saying. You you had a this this movie did everything wrong, and it could have been for me a passable sequel up until that very moment. Up until that very moment. No, the you, movie was meant to be long before that jump scare. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, no, n not all sequels are bad. Not all remakes are mm. bad. But this... Hashtag this, not all remakes. Hashtag not all remakes. But, mm -hmm. you know, you could have... Why didn't they hire the guys that were doing the promotional material to make this movie? 
I mean, yeah. It would have been so much better. Yeah, they really. I mean, I guess the do. marketing team behind Kiri had much more than the actual movie. Hey, you're, well, you're good at marketing? Here, I mean, you really... direct this movie instead. We suck at it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Does anyone else have something to say about it? No. Well, well, I, I never saw it, so... Yeah. I saw the original, but... Yeah. I liked it, but I'm not saw the remake. I just saw it. I was like... When, the, when Junior Moore doing the head banging on the wall, I was like, that's not for me. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um... Another another nitpick you just reminded me of actually the line about the uh, the line about Terry's dirty pillows metaphorical dirty dirty pillows or like literal dirty pillows like that, she, that she's got pillows that she needs washing there's a there's a line in the film in both versions of the film that um, that only makes sense in context with the uh, with the original film, it was, you know, it took place in the South. In the remake, it was elsewhere, United States. So, the line "dirty pillows" is sort of a is sort of a Southern line referring to a woman's breast. Disease. No kidding. So, um, I have when, one more yes. Unless you're not done, David. I'm not quite done yet. But uh, we discussed this last time. <laughs> in the remake, in the in the uh, in the original film, uh, Carrie's dressing up for prom night, and her mom comes up to her with a southern drawl uh, intact and everything like that, and she says, "Carrie, I can see your dirty pillows." And she comes back and says, "Mama, they're called breasts." Now this is a very you you think I wouldn't nitpick about this, but they they re they use this line in the remake. And Julianne Moore does it so different. She's like I can see your dirty pillows. And I'm like, this isn't the South, you this is the twenty first century. No one says no one freaking says this anymore. Yeah, you're n- oh, you're, you're nitpicking too much. Yeah, unless you're you're being That's playful true. with your girl. And... Uh, Jada, your turn. I have one thing more to say. I think mm-hmm. that what's the actress's name? Chloe Moritz or Sissy Spacek. Chloe Moritz. I think that Chloe Moritz did a much better remake of Carrie. In two scenes in Kick Ass Two, <laughs> and let, let me just let me just make this clear: I hated Kick Ass Two. I'm not comparing this to a movie but... I liked, but I'm just saying, if I could put the rip off of Carrie and the remake of Carrie, Chloe did a much better remake of Carrie in Kick Ass Two. What What did she do in Kick Ass Two? Have you not seen Kick Ass Two? Nope. Oh, well, then it's totally lost on you, isn't it? <laughs> she, there, there's a well, now I gotta see. There's a subplot where she goes to high school and she, like, interacts with bully characters. It's it's mm-hmm. very stupid. It's sort of. It's basically like character like, stuff. Mm-hmm. Now that that joke's been explained, I'm sure it's much funnier to you all. Yes. So yes, you, I don't don't know, you head back and laugh. That's a knee slapper. <laughs> ah, 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 I get it now. Okay. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> I think my kitty can get it, though. Uh-huh. <laughs> kitty. <laughs> ah, cruel. Oh, it's oh. a cat. Cat? <laughs> and we're going to talk about dogs. 101 Dalmatians. Yes, 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 and I did look it up. It is a remake, so yes, it's a that's very yes. interesting. A live action remake of the Disney's classic. Now, uh, before we start getting into it, I just want to start off by saying that 
Uh, when it comes to remakes and animation, they're practically non-existent. Uh, nobody would... There's not a lot of people who would want to remake animated features, and there's not a lot of, like, animated features that would want to be remakes of live-action films. The closest that you could ever find is probably in Japan, where there's, um, there's a remake of Grave of the Fireflies, and there's also Metropolis, which is a remake of the classic uh, movie of the 30s, I believe, or 40s. 27. Uh, 27, yeah, actually, yes. Yeah. Yes. But then comes 101 Dalmatians, which, uh, interestingly enough, since Disney is in this big trend of like rebooting uh, their animated features, this one came out all the way back in 1996. Um, but first and foremost, let me talk about it. Let me talk a bit about 101 Dalmatians. Um, funny enough, it's actually very, it's a very very straightforward film. It's pretty much that the puppies are like puppies are missing, and we got to go save the puppies. And um, like it's a it's a rather simple film. This is the first one where they decided to take a break from fairy tales after Sleeping Beauty, and it really shows. Considering like all the characters are pretty simplified, and like again the story is just very straightforward. It's a rather simple animated feature, but you know there are it's still a good film. Like the animation is top notch. Uh, some of the you know some of the animal characters are likable, like. Uh, the sergeant, the lieutenant, and the colonel. Um, I love the also... cat. The cat. Yeah, that's sergeant. Great. That's sergeant. I love him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's got a candy. He's a cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, oh yeah, yeah that was very, back like, in the day. It definitely has a, a fun, timeless feel. Like, it's not the best Disney film that they've made, but also, but it is also one of the more historically important ones because this is the first one where they do the Xerox process to color their animation instead of doing hand-painted cells. So it's definitely a landmark in there. But then we have the, uh, 1996, animate, uh, the 1996 live action and film. it's 38% uh, Rotten and Rotten Tomatoes. And oh, honestly... It should be 138% Well, the original is 98% honestly, fresh. I was watching it. And by the way... Um, the one thing I loved about 101 Dalmatians is the music. Oh, the songs like Cruella de Vil, Cruella de Vil. Although I think that's the, the only song I actually... Well, come know. on, that's... When you have a song like that, that's just greatness uh -huh. right there. Yeah. It's like, there's that and there's Dalmatian Plantation at the end. Uh, uh, we have, we have also some great uh, animated uh, uh uh, comic, uh, comic relief moments from Horace and Jasper, some terrific slapstick humor. Yeah, but like I said, like the animation is definitely mm -hmm. top notch. It's probably it's pretty much the best thing about that movie. But anyway, sorry. But anyways, going back to the 1996 movie, which is actually written by John yes. Hughes. Uh, yes, the John mm -hmm. Hughes. Honestly. Okay, it was kind of weird when watching it. During the first half, I was loving it. I felt like it was already much better than the animated film because, like, they, the characters are much more fleshed out. And th they're definitely much more interesting. Like, you, you know their backstory. And even, like, the performances are fantastic, especially from, like, uh, Glenn Close, Hugh Laurie, uh, the other guy who played Horace, uh, Roger... Uh, Anita, like they're all fantastic. How's and then, MD and uh, and uh, Ron Weasley's dad? Yeah, Mark uh, Williams. Yeah, Horace. There yep. you go. Yes, thank you. And then you go to the second half. Mm -hmm. The second half, holy crap! It has now become much more of a cartoon than the animated <laughs> feature <laughs> because oh, basically boy. it's. It just becomes nothing but a series of slapstick and, like, pratfalls and all that kind of stuff. Where basically, and it's even more wackier because now they bring in a lot more animals to it. Because beforehand, um, it was all organized, uh, it, it was pretty much mostly the Dalmatians and, like, just a few other helping animals. Like the cows, um, a lassie dog. Uh, and then, like I said, the lieutenant, the colonel, and the sergeant. Like, that's pretty the much it. The, 
collie? Yeah, the collie. Collie, a laffy dog. Yeah, collie, thank you. And then, like, and then, like, in the, in the, in the John, John Hughes movie, you brought in all <laughs> these different animals. They brought in woodpeckers, crows, raccoons, squirrels. Everybody's all in it, pretty much. Like, and it's so weird. And plus the fact, like, one of the biggest difference about uh, 100, like, the two 101 Dalmatians is mostly through the perspective. In the animated feature, uh, we mostly see it through the perspective of the animals, which is, con which is very commonplace that in an animated film that we see talking sentient animals. Like, no problem, all right, that's fine, that's natural. But then in the live action film, the animals don't talk, but it's so weird how they're sentient. Like, they're still portrayed like ridiculously smart animals. Like, I was pretty much blown away at the opening how freaking smart Pongo is. Like, I'm talking about like, we're like we're legit talking about the live action grommet. Like that's smart. Like just pretty much helping Roger to start the day and all that's that. acting from animal actors and yeah, trainers. But it's mm -hmm. so though. It's like are animals really that freaking smart? Like what the Probably hell? Probably not. I mean they had no, trailer, not. Uh, trailers. They had trainers on set trying to <laughs> teach the dog to do the and, things, and they. It was a pretty good, good animal actor there. Also, if I, but also there are a few downsides that the remake has. Like, although that, um, there they do have much better human. Like the live action film has way better um, human characters than the animated version. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with it is that it it does have a bit of a like uh, the John Hughes one does have a bit of a dated feel. And as I mentioned, like, the prep balls, the slapstick and all that stuff, like, it is very 90s. This is a very mm -hmm. 90s movie in terms of the comedic oh, style. Yeah. Um, also, the fact that one of the changes that they did, um, I don't mind that much, honestly. Like, if there's one thing that they changed from the original is um, Roger's, um, it's Roger's career. In the animated version, and I think like in the original book as well, it, Roger is a musician, and he's trying to find like, uh, trying to get a hit song, which ended up being Corella de Vil. Uh, but then, in the in the live action version though, <laughs> um, Roger is a video game programmer, and this is where you get the references of the original uh, 101 Dalmatians because he's trying to make a hit game with his, well, with his Dalmatian game pretty much. Gotta and get we, hip with the kids of today, man. Kids because today are playing have, video games. We're gonna be cool and, and hip. Yeah, yeah. Kids don't make um, video games and so Kids don't like music or jazz. No, but the yeah. weird thing is like, the, it's, it's like the dated aspect is mostly the computers he would use and like how video games are actually portrayed. Like, pretty much like they, they, like they keep on saying, well, it, it's a grow, you know, it's a growing industry and stuff like that. And like you see how Cruella, <laughs> like it's funny how Cruella actually riffs on it. It's like, oh, there are people who actually make those infernal things that children just stare at the television for. <laughs> no one's ever watched yeah. TV or anything like that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, like that, by the way. Latest but film. yeah, like that's, that's one of the. how she talked. <laughs> but yeah, like that dated. <laughs> is probably the low like kind of the things that's inferior to the animated feature because like well like as straightforward and simplistic as it is like it does have a bit of a timeless feel like mm -hmm. you like when you watch it like it can be said like when like it does have a setting like you'll feel great no matter when you're gonna watch it but like when you watch the john hughes movie it's like yeah this is 90s <laughs> it's like you could tell this is coming from the 90s but overall uh i would say that 101 Dalmatians, like, both movies, I would say they're equally good, but it's for all the completely different reasons. Like, it's not that they have some strengths, like, some of the same strengths and the same weaknesses. It's that they actually, they're both equally good because of completely different strengths and weaknesses. And it was, it was rather interesting, like, to watch both together. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. 
nothing about the creation or result of the live action Honey Run Dell Macy's movie surprises me. Given that it's written by John Hughes and in the 90s as well, post Home Alone, which had a mm-hmm. massive effect on the way he did his fictional work, let me tell you. <laughs> see, see, Boy. What Hunter Run Dell Macy's was very slapstick focused in the second act and the climax, so it does not surprise me that John Hughes gravitated towards it for like a adaptation. Like, you've got the freaking two bandits breaking into houses and getting the slapstick shenanigans. Huh. Mm-hmm. Don't that ring a bell? Speaking of. Well, that was oh, a lot of different movies in the 90s were, were trying to copy that formula also. I know, but, but that, that's, that's what I want to talk about for a minute. I want to talk about why the constant trying to repeat the success of Home Alone didn't work. Because people got that Home Alone worked, but they didn't really get why. Even John Hughes, I don't think, really got why the little work. Because, see, the problem that these copies had is either they were too tame, like way too cuddly and weak and cartoonish and not nearly biting enough, or they were too mean spirited because the slapsticks were happening to, you know, innocent people as opposed to terrible bad guys who were trying to come down and probably kill a kid. See, Mm -hmm. Bone Alone. Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern, they got the shit kicked out of them in that slapstick stuff. Like, they got real, they got really violent. That was what made it funny. But, like, friggin' later movies have them friggin' fall onto trampolines and into puddles. And it's just not the same. They'll have unrealistic cartoon slapsticks, and it just doesn't feel as real or edgy. And I know edgy is, like, an adjective that's usually problematic these days, but I really mean it this this time, you know? No, hold on a minute. Here's one thing, though, that they did that I thought was rather edgy, was uh, they had Horace and Jasper getting their balls electrocuted. Oh, yeah. I transitioned... Rated G, by the way. Sorry. But it's funny. But what I'm trying to say is Wait, Jada, Jada, time out, time out, time out. Project. Uh, fix. The microphone's quiet. What? Fix the volume. What? The microphone, it was going down. Oh, yeah. dear. I'm not doing anything to the microphone, it's, you guys. The microphone's okay. rebelling. It's, it's, it's going to take over. The machines are taking over. <laughs> No, but uh, okay. Just to repeat, for those of you who didn't get what Jada's saying, is that uh, what worked in the Hundred One Dalmatians is that uh, the villains, like it's it's a it, it works that the villains get all like the pratfalls and the different slapsticks because they were trying to kill puppies and like it's funny to see their comeuppance. Is that what you were trying? <laughs> Like, uh, if I may, but if I may just rebuttal for that, it's just that I feel like it's gone completely, like the, like it's completely unexpected and just completely different in tone. Like, you wouldn't really expect this, like, in in something like a Disney remake, something like based on 101 Dalmatians or anything like that. Yes, there is slapstick in. Uh, in the animated film, but this one just takes it like, like what John Hughes did there was like Looney Tunes level. Just replace the puppies with the Roadrunner and Horace and Jasper with Wally e. Coyote, and you get the <laughs> same result. That was one of the things I loved about the movie so much was that it was like a live action cartoon, especially in all of the. Me Steve too. Films. Like I swear and, to God, yeah, I, I don't, like... I don't uh, see why people would not like it. It's a 101 Dalmatians, and people were expecting a little more, but. 
it was somewhat connected to the 1963 version, so I don't know why people were like, you know, that's the thing. No, 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 no. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying it's bad. I just feel like, where did this come from? <laughs> like, I, I guess you got to be in the right tone because, like, for me, like, for me, like, I, I guess I kind of watch it in a, in a bad, like, I kind of watch it in a bad time because, like, I saw, like, I, like, I just saw this not too long ago, actually, for the sake of this uh, podcast. Like, I saw 101 Dalmatians, like, the animated version, and then jump ahead to, uh, to uh, the John Hughes movie. That you should not do. I recommend not doing that. Because, like, you get a completely different tone. And, like, you got to be in the right mindset to fully enjoy 101 Dalmatians. Can we talk mm-hmm. about how awesome Talk about how awesome Glenn Close was. Woof, woof, woof. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please, please, please do. 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 Please no, do. No. You want to talk about the cartoonish feel? Glenn Close is in like an entirely other dimension in this movie. Like she is actually playing a cartoon character. There is nothing remotely engaged. Like, not. She's not not engaging, but there is nothing remotely connected to reality about what she's doing. (laughs) She is playing it exactly, if not more psychotically, like she is in the animated movie. And it's just totally disconnected from everything, but in the best possible way. Like, it's astounding to watch. That's exactly how I... Yeah, that's exactly how I feel, actually. It's that, like, Glenn Close actually got the... Like, she she pretty much um, really hit the nail on the head with her performance to be like the animated version but the best part is what makes her works work even better is that she added a lot more to it and i think that's more thanks to the writing now that like she has a motivation now that she has purpose now we know what like what she's doing and stuff like that like it really does make it effective and she really plays it so well like especially like the opening like like during the beginning when we see like her discovery of what she wants to do like why she wants to uh, uh, take the puppies and like to make a fur coat out of it. It's like, it's almost like I'm wearing your dog. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And that's why I just can't hate this thing. It's just, uh, blimp clothes were just great. I just, you know, you just can't hate it. Mm -hmm. Which is why, which is why she was the only one they brought back for the sequel, 102 Dalmatians. But that movie had its I was just going to ask, Matt, which sequel was better? I, I don't know. I don't want to watch those. <laughs> it's actually really London really Adventure or actually... 102 Dalmatian. Yeah, it's actually really interesting that the, like those two movies have two different yes. sequels. That's completely different from yeah. one another. But I will say, like we've already, and plus the fact I just want to a quick mention the fact that we they it actually spun off. Uh, the yes. animated series, which we yes, and about. I just realized this is the second time we've mentioned RoboCop and 101 Dimensions in the same episode again. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and also actually... there was a, a PC game based on a 1996 live action movie. Oh yes. Oh, well, I, I think. Oh, was it to be like? I guess it was supposed. Like it would. It would actually make a lot of sense. It was. It was supposed to spit. Like it's supposed to be like. This is the game that Roger made. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. I was the Puppy Vision. We have that camera, so. You know. But yeah, um, 101 Dalmatians, another series, you know, I think that's not really surprising because, you know, it's more of a kids' show, kids' series, so. Uh, also, like, 2003 one, 101 Dalmatians 2. Oh, this is when this Disney went sequel crazy. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, that awkward period. When John Lasseter came in and just went, stop, stop everything. At at least the patch of London Adventure was was better than freaking 102 Dalmatians. 
I don't know. I mean, that's a pretty. That's not a contest with winners. Let's be real here. <laughs> well, there are some winners, but like, eh, there's not a lot of winners, unfortunately. Quote of the day. <laughs> The honor of quote of the day on his Facebook. Yay! Yay. Okay, am I frozen? Because you are, you're all frozen to me. Yeah, I mean. Yep, you're frozen. Everybody's frozen. Yeah. Everybody's frozen. Yay! It's not just me for once. And I'm the frozen. I mean, I'm really not frozen. good. Uh, Mike, you're frozen, and Jada, you're frozen. Oh. Everybody's just, well, we just gotta. Well, we just gotta let it go. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it was there. Damn it! Why? <laughs> I was Damn just, it! throughout the whole time. I was actually thinking. <laughs> and then the Skype just died. Whoa! Sounds like Jada murdered somebody over there. What <laughs> I was happened? Gonna say, yeah. What the hell is going on? Did she step on a brick? Whoa. Actually, you know the funny thing is, is that oh. through, throughout the whole time when someone mentioned it, I was like, I think so. I think Jada is frozen. It was like I was just thinking throughout the whole time. I was like, please nobody make a frozen joke. Please nobody make a frozen joke. Please nobody make a frozen joke. Damn it! I see now. Okay, it was right there. Yeah. It was right there. Okay, now on my end's back to normal. I'm back. Uh, nobody's frozen. No, anymore. it's back so to normal now. Screen. Well, it was you know. Hey, you know that's good. You know. Good, good, good. Because, hey, love is an open door, so. Stop, dude. I can t- travel through cyberspace. I can do it. <laughs> hey, what can- Hey. It's the best time to do it now. Because you can only make frozen jokes in summer. Mm-hmm. Hi. I'm sorry. Is it a fixer-upper? It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, minions. <laughs> so, we have saved the best for the last, the epic grand Yay. finale. <clears throat> it's an 80s Ow. remake, Clash of the Titans, and mind you, it's 28% rotten on Rotten Tomatoes, the lowest of our all over films. 28? Yes, really? 28% I was rotten. Expecting much lower. And the original has 66% brush, so. Flash the Titans. Jada, take take it it away. away. Okay. So. Once upon a time, it was the 80s. Look how this is going. (laughs) And Mike was happy. (laughs) Mike was good. And there were a lot of classic fantasy films being released, like Lawrence of Arabia, and... What? The... Lawrence of Arabia was 50! What the fridge are you talking about? Not that, Lawrence of Arabia. Don't interrupt me, Matt. I'm trying to build up... She's trying to tell us a story. Now listen, now shut up. (laughs) Man. 60, by the way. I was close. Among these classic 80s fantasies, there came... A little film with Lawrence Olivier. That's why I was thinking Lawrence of Arabia, because the little Lawrence. Based on the myths of the Greek gods called Clash of the Titans. In Clash of the Titans, there was a man, not played by Lawrence Olivier, because he was old at the time and could no longer be protagonists in these type of movies. That's why he was Zeus. But that's not important right now. Are you still with me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. You better stay with me, you guys, because... So there was a young, non-Lawrence Olivier protagonist, and his name was... Hold on a minute. God damn it. That's not what I remember. I thought his name was something else. Yep. Here. Did, uh, Here we go again. Oh, okay. 
Mute the mic. Mute Worst the mic. case scenario, like I got, I got my animation look back thing that you can use. Right. <laughs> I talked about yes, it. Yes, Harry, Ray Harryhausen, the final work of his stop motion epicness. Okay, I fixed it. So his name is Perseus. That was the point of all that build up. His name is Perseus, and he's the son of Zeus. He gets born. He lives on an island. He gets moved from the island by Thetis because Thetis was feeling very bitchy because Zeus was feeling very bitchy and the gods in general are pretty bitchy. And he goes mm -hmm. on to have adventures to, you know, show off his fancy sword that he got and also to get a girl and also to stop the Kraken. And, and he to play a Gorgon. It's a very simple film, very close, and this is what makes it interesting, very close to the original story of Greek mythology, which is not something you're going to see a lot of nowadays. Nowadays, Greek mythology is lucky if it has anything portrayed accurately in it. Thanks, Disney. <laughs> I was about to say, like, nowadays, they're being more, they're being more true to Disney. <laughs> they are. They are. And we'll get to that. It went on to mm -hmm. become a classic, as well as one of the and my favorite. I like it because of its classic feel. I like it because I love Greek mythology stuff. I like it because it's focused on like female characters with the female gods, Princess Andromeda, who's like a princess, but she also helps with the battle and stuff. I like it because it has a little robot owl, and somehow that doesn't. Ubo. Ubo. Ubo's not in the remake. No, there's like yes, yes there's he a cameo. Is. Yes, he cameo is. in both the remake and the sequel. Yeah. That cameo. Yeah. Was a slap in the it face. It was. A uh, hey, mm -hmm. you know, exist. We're not gonna put him in the movie because that was a stupid. Let's no, that's pretty much. No, that's pretty much the treatment to the original. It's like, what the hell is this? No, just leave it. We don't need that thing. Yes, you're down. We have a hot chick. We're good. <laughs> we have a sexy. Medusa. Just leave it. That owl has no tits. So cut to the mid 2000s. Uh, 2010. becoming. 2010. Five years whatever. ago. In like 25 years, it'll be the mid-2000s. Greek mythology is kind of a thing, again. Thanks in part to the Percy Jackson movies. Thanks. Mm. And 300. And 300. Oh, Thanks. And because remakes are a thing, enter the remake of Clash of the Titans. Don't Clash forget our favorite... Uh... Our, our favorite uh, blockbuster actor, Sam Worthington. Sam oh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Avatar. Sam, Sam is pretty... Yeah, like, honestly, Sam was pretty much at his worst here. Mm. That's something. Okay. That's why I consider him my, my blockbuster test tube baby. Because he, like, came out and made all these movies. <laughs> That were big, and then they just sort, then he just sort of disappeared, and he thought, "I'm gonna wait for Avatar 2." He's too. in the, he's working in the background. Don't you worry, he's not like in major motion okay. pictures. Okay. Don't worry. Oh, no, he's going okay. to be in Everest, actually. Okay. 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 Guys. What? If, if I can just stop Leo Getzing for a minute, and y'all let mm -hmm. me talk. Okay. So, Flash Titans is the first movie I've ever seen, and probably ever will see. Like I said, it's rebelling. It's, it's, it, it's, it's not like <laughs> it's weird. Stop Something's up. up. I can't turn it up any higher. There's nothing I can do. Skype. It's okay. It's, you know. and your mic? <laughs> My mic is fine. It 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 sounds fine now. Keep yep, going. Yep. Let's Keep go with going. the flow. Go. Sorry. First of all, it's back to Hades as the bad guy. 
even though Hades was not in the original movie at all. I at never got all. that. That's true. He was never even mentioned because he didn't need to be because he's the god of the underworld and in actual Greek mythology. Hades, the god of the underworld, does not get involved in the shit that goes on on Earth because he does not care because he is busy looking after the dead. He does not give a shit. He is not trying to take over Olympus like he does in the Disney movie. Thanks. This is why yeah, Hercules' the legendary journey is the most accurate portrayal of Hades ever. Uh, and freaking yeah. Hades is played this time by Ray Fiennes, who you might know as Voldemort. And here's the thing about Ray Fiennes. <laughs> oh my god, that makes so much sense. Yeah. Here's the thing. Ray Fiennes is actually a very good actor with a lot of range, uh -huh. especially as villains. Like, if you see him in Red Dragon, he was great in Red Dragon. Prince of Egypt, he was great. Friggin... He's really good at playing villains that don't act like Voldemort. So, he, what I have to assume is that when they got Ray Fiennes on set, the director and the producer and everybody sort of looked at him and went, you know what? Just act like Voldemort. You know, just act like that hammy, barely awake, yet somehow way over the top villain that we all loved in Harry Potter and totally took seriously. <laughs> and just, just play him like that. Just play him like he's high off his meds and, you know, it'll be good. He'll totally be the best Hades ever. And then they gave him dreads and yeah, a really well. stupid tornado effect in the soundtrack to Jaws. And their villain was complete. And, okay. His... In the original Clash of Titans, the villain, or at least the closest equivalent of the villain, was Thetis, wife of Poseidon, and Poseidon was the Kraken. But in the remake, Poseidon doesn't own the Kraken, even though he's the god of the sea, and he is technically in the movie, even if he doesn't really do anything, he's just there in the background, like he's seat number four in the big round table scenes. No, now Hades owns the Kraken, because... He mm -hmm. kills the Kraken in the sea. He brings him no, out. He unleashed the, no, to be fair, on Disney's part, like they, he unleashed the Titans. He didn't own them. Okay, I'm saying they wanted to be more like the Sea Hercules by making him pull something out of the ocean. So they were like, let's let's just have him pull the Kraken out of the ocean because fuck the side, am I right? And fuck <laughs> Vegas, who's not even in the movie. Because Hades none is of, also Davy Jones. None of the female gods are in the movie. There's not one single female Greek god in the movie. Not one. There's no Hera. There's no Aphrodite. There's no Artemis. There's none of them. None of them show up. The only gods of any consequence are Zeus and Hades. That's it. The rest of them have cameos at best and aren't even mentioned at worst. They mention Aphrodite at one point when friggin' the dumbass and Andromeda's mom, and this, this kind of happened in the original, only different and better, pointed out that her daughter was more beautiful than Aphrodite, and that goes Hades into showing up. Because since when does Aphrodite answer to challenges of her beauty? She doesn't do that. She doesn't care. She's told, she's way too peaceful for that shit. Yeah. No, it was, it was Hades that had to interview for her. Ugh. This is one way that feminism has ruined the remake. Feminism didn't ruin the remake. Sexism ruined the remake. <laughs> The 80s movie was way more feminist than the remake was. First of all, Princess Andromeda is a non-character. Like, she's there, but she's also not there. She's just, she doesn't really do anything. And instead, as the main love interest, they bring in Bubo, or a hot chick in place of Bubo, who's one of the muses. Bubo. And you can tell she's one of the muses because she is small, doesn't sing, and is white. Because the muses were white, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> All Greeks were white. Everybody knows that. Yeah. And, and she just kind of like stands around, doesn't really do anything, offers demure wisdom, and then dies and then comes back. And she, she gets with boring Nick Sam Worthington, who is so unbelievably dull in this movie. Like, he is just this growly, angsty, I hate the gods, but I'll help you anyway, because fuck it. Friggin'. Perseus in the original was like this charming guy who kind of started the movie like a dumbass, like, whoa, sort of Keanu Reevesing it through everything, not knowing what's going on. But then once he got the hang of it, he became like this courageous hero and you rooted for him and stuff. He had a personality. A personality. You guys know what that is? 
That is what keeps a character from becoming dull as tar. Like fucking Sam Worthington from Avatar. And Terminator. Who had such a promising career ahead of them. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, Jada, Jada. Oh, do you mind? An yeah, like, that's great and all. Do you mind answering me, answering me th this question? What was the point of those two idiots following uh, Sam Worthington around? That was because um, of comedy. We needed to have comic relief that wasn't funny. We had to have side characters like friggin' Hannibal Lecter from the show Hannibal, who doesn't really do anything, and Sir Davos from Game of Thrones, who doesn't really do anything. Never and... have I seen comic relief so useless more than that, my god. Nobody really does anything. Everybody's just kind of going through the motions. For the record, half of the plot of the original movie is just cut out, and it's entirely focused on the Kraken. But that's okay, because they cut this out with the reasoning of the gods, because in the original, the gods were just fucking around doing their god thing, and they didn't really have consequences because they were the gods. They were more plot devices than characters, even though they had personalities. I <laughs> am a god. God, god, god. I do, god, god. But in the remake, because we need to make this, you know, Greek mythology story appeal to modern audiences way of thinking about, you know, deities. It has this really confused sort of backstory for the god prayer. They want humans to appreciate them more because humans are starting to believe in them less and support them less because of all they've been acting like tyrants. And if the humans don't believe in the gods, then the gods lose their power. Even though that's not remotely true, in the mm -hmm. movie that's true because we need to give the gods the reason to not be bad guys except for Hades. Because Hades doesn't need people to believe in him in order to exist. Because... Reasons. He has dreads. And a kraken. Poseidon doesn't have a kraken, so he's fucked. So Liam Neeson, he's like this character. He caused Sam Worthington's boat to sink so that his kindly old Uncle Ben Farmer boatsman died. He's all sad. For the record, his parents don't die in... Or rather, his mother, because it's just his mother, does not die in the original movie. He just kind of grows up with a happy childhood and then has adventures. But that's not hardcore enough for our modern audience. No, he needs to have a tragic backstory where his family dies. He's all alone. Does that make them more engaging? Because they would be able to buy one to that man. Well, the so Warner Bros. did the he, film, like, so... And Lincoln Mason has, like, this whole thing where he's, like, trying to connect himself to Sam Worthington and Sam Worthington no, you're a jerk, and the movie doesn't know whether it wants us to agree with this or not. Like, are we meant to look at Liam Neeson as this wise figure? Are we meant to look at him as a total douchebag? Does anything matter? No, it doesn't, because we're too busy distracting ourselves with a million other questions of why they did the things they did. Like, why is there a subplot with Princess Andromeda dealing with the people in the village, like, not supporting the gods and wanting Andromeda to die? Why do we care about whether Andromeda dies? Andromeda dying will save us from the Kraken and we haven't gotten attached to her character like we did in the original movie. Why does it matter what the, the villagers think if we're too busy focusing on what the main characters think? Because apparently what the villagers think doesn't actually have that big an impact on the gods because the villagers haven't changed their minds by the end of the movie. Nothing's changed, yet somehow the gods are fine because stopping Hades from, defeat, from unleashing the Kraken somehow kept the gods from becoming not believed in, even though that was a problem before that even became like Hades' plan. Why did we bother showing Bubo and then like just throwing him back to the thing? Why in this universe of gritty realism is there a robot owl just in a chest? Why did the muse not do anything? And why is she a muse if she doesn't know any other muses? Why is Medusa hot? She's okay, Medusa. whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, before you get You're into asking. that, let me give you a little bit of a backstory about the Medusa. In the original 1980s movie, when Ray Harryhausen designed his Medusa, he tried his best to avoid like the stereotype of the pretty girl with uh, snake hair and stuff like that, and want wanted to do something special, something more complex, thus resulting to the to the ugly-looking, more snake-like Medusa that we see in the original film. Now, Jada, how is the Medusa in the remake? Glad you're done, Matt, because I was in the middle of a rant there. It's not special for her not to be a hot girl stereotype. She was never a hot girl stereotype. The entire point of Medusa's backstory is that Aphrodite was jealous of her beauty and the fact that she slept with her husband, which, by the way, 
they turned that into a rape story in the remake because that makes it edgier, right? And that was that totally had a point. Thanks, movie. Really anyway, so so she got raped in the remake. That's great. So just having an affair. So she was made ugly because that's the entire point of Medusa. That Aphrodite took her beauty because Aphrodite is a pretty bitch and turned her into this, a creature so ugly that she turns people into stone. In the remake, she just turns people into stone because that's her magic power, but she actually has an uber pretty doll-like face that we see, and like this friggin' curvaceous body with this breast with a little mermaid bra that looks ridiculous. She's like this CGI Megan Fox looking fucker. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, you made Medusa hot. You were so afraid of having a not conventionally attractive woman shown in your movie that has barely any women in it that you had to defy one of the most basic rules of a Greek mythology story ever conceived. That is how little this movie gets Greek mythology right. Ah. Why weren't the three, you know, mage women pretty? Because they're women too, but I guess that's okay, because we can have them be ugly, because they're witches and they're old. You know, Medusa's not old, I mean, she's that thousand years old, but she's not elderly, so we can make her hot. That's fine. <sighs> it's a cacophony of just shit. too many questions. Why did Aphrodite never show up when Aphrodite specifically was insulted and they established with the Medusa backstory that she is the same spiteful bitch that she is in Greek mythology? Why does Hades have the power of the Kraken from the Underworld? And if that's the case, why isn't the Kraken in the Underworld instead of in the ocean? Why does he have the one dude from the Underworld that he brings back that's essentially supposed to be the equivalent of, like, Fetus's mutant son? And why does why does that dude never try to get revenge on the gods themselves? And why is he, why does nobody know that Hades has this guy? Why does everybody trust Hades when he has all this shit on standby? When he had the Kraken, the great evil that he unleashed? Why does Zeus believe whatever he says if Zeus is supposedly a good guy? Why did Zeus try to destroy the boat with his family on it? And why didn't he make sure that Sam Worthington was dead? Because he's Zeus. He should be able to do that. Why? Why, because why, did of the bring reason. A, why did he bring the friggin' Muse women, woman back at the end when he knew the Sam Worthington wouldn't join him? Why did he want Sam Worthington to join him in the first place? The gods never allowed their half-human babies to join them in Olympus. Thanks, Disney's Hercules! Why did he give him the, the award when Sam Worthington rejected him? Why did Sam Worthington reject him when he was held at the end? What was the point of any of this development if he feels the exact same way he always did about Greek gods, as well as everybody? Why did you bring up the whole non-believing thing if you weren't going to fill that through? Why? What was the point of the muse even dying if you were just going to bring her back? What emotional residence does that leave? Why? Why are we here? Why is there life? Why do kids enjoy the taste of cinnamon toast? Don't the robotic why at the Why? 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 I just don't understand. Overall, it's a pretty good film. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this. F I'd like to voice a few things. About why does Hades have might. butterfly wings? Why does Hades not come back after the end when he was knocked into the ocean? He's Hades. He's not dead. He doesn't get sucked into the soul pit like he does in Disney's Hercules. Thanks, Disney's Hercules. Thanks so much for giving us this. This is entirely um, your fault. I'm for existing. Um, the reason why is because I think the reason why I mean, in the West, I believe in America, death is bad and evil and the end of stuff. Which is, to me, you know, really childish and such. You know, it just shows that, you know, Supposedly, we're so enlightened here. We're still afraid of death and everything. Even though the Greeks were like, Hades wasn't even a main part. He was like, this is my thing, and I'm I'm happy with it. I mean, to me, you know, why couldn't they just have... There's other gods there. Ares, um, you know, Aphrodite, you know... And there's so many other gods that could be antagonists. In fact, in the sequel, they actually had Hades... I uh, know, uh, Ares as one of the protagonists. Uh, antagonist. The thing about the sequel, Wrath of the Titans, is that it tried to fix some of the problems that the original had, like mainly with the inaccuracies. Like Hades is less evil, and for some reason he's just kind of hanging out with them because I guess they just forgave him. I suppose that sort of makes sense in the context of how Greek gods think, 
but that's not how they think in the movie because it's all different and more modern, even though not and very confused. So it doesn't make any sense, but that's fine. And they have a few more other gods that make appearances and are relevant, and it's a little bit... But everybody's acting is still terrible. Like, everybody. Liam Neeson is phoned in. Ray Fiennes is totally phoned in Voldemort bullshit that's not even, like, engaging. It's ridiculous. Sam Worthington is boring. Friggin' Hannibal Lecter is boring. Davos is boring. Andromeda and the Mutes are both barely even there. They're just glossy-eyed whenever you look at them. There is not a single actor you can pick out from Clash of the Titans or Wrath of the Titans that gave a performance worth talking about or thinking about because it is just completely, they don't give a shit at all. It is just land characters in a ridiculous story that spits in the face of everything that made the original Clash of the Titans unique and original and fun in the name of being like this epic Lord of the Rings-esque action fest that doesn't even make any sense because the conflicts are just completely pointless and don't get resolved. And nothing is fun. And the CGI is atrocious. God, those scorpions looked worse in the remake than they did when they were stop motion. How is that possible? Yeah, well... Oh, um, oh yeah, by the way, was actually... I wanted to mention, actually. Go on. Um, with, with, the, uh, with the original film, that was... That was Ray Harryhausen trying to give his, uh, you know, stop motion effects one last final huzzah. Even though, even though um, I, I think they they continued using stop motion effects for what roughly the next ten years or so in mm-hmm. Hollywood films. But um, he went out and, on top. Yeah, and with the the original, which. I, I, I have respect for the film. I, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's as big of a uh, my personal classic as uh, as anybody else's, but it had some nice PG nudity. Um, with uh, with uh, with that film, that's what it was trying to do. It was it it sticks out. It stands out because of that. Um, and with I, I also understand that they were trying to be uh, they they were hoping for a sequel and whatnot, which never happened because the film was not was not financially successful. Mm-hmm. Um, with the remake, the the CGI effects and everything, they just uh, sub, they don't stand out. I mean, I I didn't I gave the movie a pass personally, but it it just um, all the CGI. Uh, no, it's okay. Makes, She's gone. Say all the good things you want now. <laughs> say it 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 um it it doesn't make the movie stand out. It makes it look like another standard run of the mill blockbuster, and. The good thing, good-ish thing that I can say is probably with uh, the remake, at least it got a sequel, which was what the original movie was trying to do. Um, So maybe there's a spiritual successor in there. I don't know. I never saw it. The spiritual successor, well, like, the sequels, technically it came in comic book form. So at least there is a happy ending to the original. Mm-hmm. Mm. Oh, hold on, I'll add her back in, for fuck's sake. Yeah. Ah, uh, Skype. Uh, by the way, uh, back to the movie, uh, there was actually a video game tie-in to this uh, mm-hmm. uh, Clash mm-hmm. of Titans, and it didn't do well. <laughs> no shit, Sherlock. Really? <laughs> yeah. A movie based... A movie tie-in video game that didn't do well. What? Hey, the guys, Spider-Man ones were good. Yes. Oh, well, yeah. Yes, Jada? I got completely booted from the call. I don't know what happened, but I think I fixed it. What did I miss in the 30s? We were talking about how much Clash of the Titans sucks, right? I was no. talking about video games. No, game. no, 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 no. I said it's not. I said it's not my classic, but it is something that stands out and it has some nice PG nudity. We were mostly talking about the original. 
Um, and I was talking about the video game. Thirty seconds. What has happened in thirty seconds? Didn't, didn't you, it, did you notice when I left? Like I noticed when you left that uh, we were trying to get you back there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was. We were talking about the CGI. Yes. Stop motion. Yes. I was, I was gonna say before I left, I was just about to say that I thought stop motion was really great, and you know. Mhm. Mm it it makes it stand out. Uh, as as a film with the remake, the CGI effects just make it look like uh, contemporary bland blockbuster. They try, that's what that's what the whole plan of the remake is trying to make a big blockbuster film out of it, big things. And, just... and mind you, the director of Clash of the Titans remake also did Transporter One and Two, Unleashed, The Credible Hulk, this film, Now You See Me. So that's his line of work, and also it was written by three people, three people, Damn it. three people wrote this remake, oh. while the original had one writer, one fe yeah, one three female writer. Yeah, three. No, three no, no, people. it was the guy writer. Three people it was, wrote the thing. It was the husband of Maggie. Oh, Smith. sorry. He, he has a girl. Sorry, name. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Three people wrote the, the movie. The person that wrote the original, the person that wrote Disney's Hercules, and the person that wrote Percy Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Somebody, somebody mashed them all together. Probably the producer, but there you know. go. That's Beverly, right. Beverly Cross. Yeah, there you go, Beverly Nobody Cross. Actually cares, Nobody cares James. now. I, I'm just, I was just making the, the thing where three people wrote this remake, and the sequel. Um, you might know the director of the sequel of Wrath of Titans. He he also directed the Chainsaw Massacre at the beginning and the last year's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, oh so. You know, so. Well, that Michael yes, that's he? that's the director of Wrath of the Titans, and two people wrote the Wrath of the Titans. Wow, this guy's I got a terrific hate. track record. But you know what? Oh, I didn't hate wow. it. I didn't hate either movie, though. I didn't hate it. Um, I thought, you know, there were some good moments in it, but it's just forgettable popcorn thriller. The original, I feel, Clash of the Titans, you know, stands up more today because not only just the... Um, the, uh, the way they did the stop motion, but the characters and everything else built to life. But this, you know, it's just to me, it's just popcorn. If, if, if you don't look at, like, Clash of Titans as a remake, it's it's a totally boring, mindless action flick that's also somewhat offensive if you take into account the lack of female representation. But when you compare it to Clash of yep. Titans, that's when it becomes an yep. atrocity. Because it flies in the face of everything that Clash of Titans did. This story was so much more... And they just fucked it up because they don't understand anything that doesn't fit into their conventional little Hollywood box brains that state that everything is actiony, everything is hardcore and gritty, and females are in the background. Yeah. Release the and, and he. <laughs> it had Liam Neeson in it, so that's uh, you know. Hades. Hades is one of my favorite Greek gods, like because he's just so chill. He's just so chill. He's just like whatever mortals doing their thing. I guess I'll whatever, and they just they they're so mean to him in fiction. I love James Woods as Hades, but that's just because he's funny. Really, and I, God of War, you know, for all the crazy stuff they have, at least they made that. I feel oh like, yeah, I the feel God of like War series. Oh yeah, I feel like hey. Hades is actually much more interesting as like this neutral, not really caring guy than he is as just an evil Mick, Evilton, Voldemort. Evil Mick stereotype. Reds and butterfly wings and like crack it. Evil make evil, evil, bad, bun, bad, 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 Evil bad, 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 he was just so ridiculous, and he's just as ridiculous in Clash of the Titans. Yeah. Yeah. Let me give you an awkward hug, Sam Worthington. Yeah, Sam Forgettable Worthington. Sam Worthington. God. Sam, Sam Worthless. Then. Clash of the Titans is the epitome that ev of everything that can be done stupidly in a remake. <laughs> The Hollywood genericness that it's 
churn through, and everything is done wrong and mistaken, and, uh, fucking all the acting is bad, all the effects are bad, bad, okay, bad. video got copyrighted. Actually, I have not been copyrighted for that yet. I... It's because you, you don't play it for more than 30 seconds, Exa I think. I think that's, that's what it is. Yeah. Nah, 10 seconds. Yeah, it's less than that. Seconds. Yeah, so... Dang, that's yeah. Oh, man, I love my timer. Ah, yes, this is the end of Cinema Royale. Whew. Boy. That was a fun adventure. Really fun discussion. Uh, really fun. I still have grapes left. Good. I totally tried running out of grapes halfway through. No, nope, you still got the grapes. That's good for you. Good for you. Um, yes. Uh, what is your favorite remake? Do you have a good... Is, is there a good remake out there? Discuss in the comments below. What is your least favorite remake? <laughs> is it Clash of the Titans? Do you agree with Jada? Do you disagree with her? Comment below. I would like to know. I don't get, I don't get comments a lot on my videos, so I'm trying to force it to people. Come on, well, it's not. Clash of Titans was got, bad, but at least there was something memorable about it. You got Liam Neeson. What did you get with the Robocop? Liam Neeson was he, at his most boring. Yeah, he Robocop had that one line. He got that one line. What one line? Release the Kraken. That Katie was. Katie says that fun. line. No, it's no, Zeus says it. He says, yeah, release the Kraken. Liam Neeson okay. says it. Okay, fine, fine. What? But what was the most memorable it. thing about the uh, 2014 RoboCop? Anybody? Uh, I had Jamie Lannister in it, I think. RoboCop. Briefly. <laughs> it has a and, and it had Sam Jackson in a completely pointless character. Oh, man. Just... Who was the most pointless cameo in that movie? <laughs> Liam Neeson in Clash of the Boy, Titans? Sam, or Samuel, Samuel Jackson in RoboCop. You decide. Yes. You make the call. You make the call. Uh, yes, and thank and thanks to the incredible Charles Thomas for coming on, guest starring on this episode. No problem. Where can everybody find you? Where can they look you up on the social webs? Well, I'm usually on my um, um, <clears throat> my little blogspot page, gct.com slash blogspot.com. Also, you can find me on my YouTube page, youtube.com slash dct and my Twitter and um, is uh, twitter.com slash dct and also I have a little Facebook thing, uh, dct productions at facebook.com so there you there go. You go. Have, have fun. fun with that people. Check him out. He's a really cool dude. He makes great videos. He even has his own podcast. Check him out. Plug. Mm -hmm. plug Everybody plug, has their plug. podcast nowadays. <laughs> Yes. It, I noticed a trend of podcasts like, whoa, whoa, wait, hey, hey. You're on my turf now, people. Back off. I also have a podcast. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> uh, so if you like Jada's rant on Clash of Titans, we're going to do some more of that next time because we're going to talk about films on Rotten Tomatoes that are 0%. This, she was ranting on a 28% Rotten Tomatoes film. What could you imagine from all of us on a 0% Rotten Tomatoes film? The Depends on 0% Rotten Tomatoes. I've never seen a film that had 0% Rotten Tomatoes. I don't think I have anyway. Well. Uh, so you haven't seen any Adam Sandler's movies in quite a while, oh. right? <laughs> I don't think any of Adam Sandler's movies have hit I don't, zero. No, I don't think so either. No, 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 no. We're at a level uh, below that. Uh, uh, Captain Madison. There are some. Um, yeah, not Buddy Lawson. Strange Lewis. I've never even heard uh, of Oh, I think I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> David Spade? Kevin James? Oh. Not Rob Schneider. Oh, no. Not no, it's, uh, yeah. um... 
No, it's actually at two percent. Actually, it is um, starring. Uh, it's that one guy you know in every Let's film. See. You can't think of the name. Jim Broadbent. Uh, it's. Uh, I was just gonna say, actually, Jim Broadbent. Um, Steve that's what Zahn. Steve Zahn is like. He's uh, the guy you know from every film. But yeah. Yeah, a lot of people did not like this but, at all. So that two percent, and you know when it was released? It was released at Super Bowl weekend. During Super Bowl weekend, yeah. More like weekend, am I right? Uh, mm-hmm. uh, That's a reference to, for if you don't know, is there a percent uh, Rotten Tomato film? <laughs> Hmm. And there's plenty, and actually, there's. I just realized that Joe Dirt Two, Beautiful Loser, is zero percent. The re- really? Joe Dirt Two already? I had high hopes too, because I have the original in DVD. Oh yeah, God, really? I'm sorry, I'm being sarcastic entirely. I don't agree with you at all. It's a cult classic. <laughs> World of the World Goliath is on is a zero percent. Yes, what? yes, oh, the whoa, film. Whoa. The... World of the World of Goliath. Yes, the film. <laughs> I gotta look at this. Where is it? Yep. It's under 2002. World of the Worlds, Goliath. The film that James and Charles here actually did a crossover Where review on. Else? Yes. Wait, By... so how the heck did that guy... Uh, uh, let's see, was it 2012? And I'm looking... Only how f- in the world did this get Only zero? five people reviewed it. Seriously. Only five people reviewed it. And that's the thing with these 0% uh, films is that... Which we'll discuss couple of weeks from now but the main thing is we're going to talk about is uh why people have not reviewed a lot of these like they don't have a lot of reviews i love the first police academy movie i never saw any of the sequels philistines just hard oh, look, Rainbow Bright. yes that's See, and that's the thing some some are like bad but some are like films you're like wait a minute what so we're gonna dis- oh come on! Never ending story two was that. Like bad. I said, the critics, the critics, and like I said, I I use Rotten Tomatoes. Everybody has their own critic site, and I play like zero percent. Let's just talk about it. It'd be an interesting discussion for next episode, and uh, you either can defend a film or rant again it like Jada did with uh, Clash of the Titans here. Yeah, I mean, me, um, yeah, I'm still in shock. I'm like, man, I mean, you actually both like the film, man. Me and James like the film. Yeah. Uh, uh, how the heck does this get a zero? Just check out the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. Maybe they, they, maybe they explain it. I don't know. Like I said, not a lot of people... I saw it. I still don't. I don't. Oh it's God. weird because some have a lot of view- reviews and some don't have a lot of reviews. And it's just weird how the, the calculations come up. And we'll discuss all that. It's very interesting. I, You just... Let this all sink into your mind and just think about the possibilities of what's. Hey, there's Buck Larson. Yep. There it is. I knew it would be here. Yes, Buck Larson. Uh, until next time, this has been Cinema Royale. Uh, see you in the next episode. Bye bye. Ciao for now, y'all. <laughs>